welcome to this edition of Motorcycle Madhouse. It's November 5th, 2018. It's happy birthday Hollywood time. It's me birthday. So I hopefully you guys have been sending out those happy birthdays out there. Also, Sundays, I'm going to be uh, taking a little break from uh, the business. As you just see right now, the studio is getting all kinds of freaking uh, remodeling done. So they put me in back, <laughs> put a black drape in the back of me. Anyway, yeah, we got the soundproofing going up. And that is because we are going to be doing some lives worldwide. And uh, the Madhouse is expanding uh with the listeners and stuff like that so we got to get a better studio better acoustics in here and you know maybe one of these days i'll be able to pronounce it <laughs> but we got a couple good uh subjects today we got a great legend coming up on uh the madhouse and everybody's gonna know him you know keith bandit ball and actually uh we borrowed the video from uh bic radio charlie does an interview with him uh good tart time charlie we have uh, bikers in our circle if you guys haven't gone over and listened to his stuff you got to get over there and listen man it's better than any mp3s you to put on or any radio stations you can uh throw on old school biker stuff right there anyway as everybody knows uh the Mongols stuff is uh started off into a circus you have had you know, that dude who's uh, testified in Waco, uh, he's infiltrated all kinds of clubs out there talking about all kinds of fantasies and shit. But just to show you, and actually a listener uh, sent me this article. Now, this happened last year, but this just shows you how bad it's getting with the freaking government. I don't know if you guys ever heard of Incl uh, Insane Clown Posse, but they lost an appeal to have an FBI report scrubbed of language referring to them as a gang. Now, the feds are out there calling them freaking uh, rock uh, or rappers and shit like that gangs. It's pretty bad. They're followers. Uh, it says the group's fans are known as Juggalos. Hey, man, I bet they know how to freaking party. They're upset that a 2001 report given to Congress describes Juggalos as a loosely organized hybrid gang. The fans filed a lawsuit in Detroit blaming the report for harassment by police. The FBI tagged Juggalos as a gang in their 2001 National Gang Threat Assessment. Yeah, the FBI should really go be going around talking about gangs right now, especially their dirty leadership that they had to get uh, cleaned out at the FBI and uh, some at the DOJ, you know, going after a president and stuff. But we won't get into politics. But yeah, we will for a second. November 6th, Tuesday, tomorrow. Get your butts out there and vote. You already got that freaking communist Pelosi going around smiling and all that shit. We're going to win the house. We're going to win the house. And they don't even have the election results in yet. And she's already out doing that. So it would be nothing but gridlock the next two years if uh, they take the house. So God help this country if they get the communists in there. Anyway, let's go back to uh, the National Gang Threat Assessment. And this is being used in Texas against uh, club guys. And you know what? Cops are saying right on the spot, your gangs, blah, blah, blah. Even if, you know, you're carrying a gun and you got a valid uh, permit, you've never done anything in your life they're still hauling your ass in so the cops getting out of hand but we got some payback coming uh later in the show it seems like and we'll show you the quick video in a second that uh a cop uh who was on a probationary period whatever he's a fucking cop whatever uh reported that a biker was shooting at him and all that shit well comes to find out that wasn't freaking happening so he got his ass fired and he got arrested so payback's a bitch Anyway, uh, the Sixth Circuit was involved in this case. Uh, the repair carries no direct legal consequences. The court also says the Justice Department isn't responsible for how other police agencies use the information. The ACLU is representing the fans. The organization didn't immediately return an email seeking comment. So 
You guys better get with it, man. Everybody out there screaming, uh, you know, the cops praise or, you know, pulse sucking them off, as I freaking call. And we'll talk about that later in the uh, show because it's interesting and it's actually one of the topics of the show. Uh, one of the guys asked about one percenters, if you can be one percent, if you're not in a club and blah, blah, blah. Uh, but we'll go into that in a second. But uh, first, let's check out that cop. And, you know, sadly, down at uh, the Texas rally, uh, there's been some fatalities. I remember uh, talking on the video about this, uh, going to these uh, big ones. All you see is all the motorcycle wrecks now and all that bullshit. Uh, oh, quick note. December 14th at 7.30. We're going to be... Uh, Broadcasting live from Rockin' the Holiday Bash, a benefit for Neon One Percenter. So we'll be worldwide on all platforms. Don't forget to uh, tune into that. We're going to have like a little telethon and uh, they're going to have the party and we're going to be talking all kinds of stuff. It's going to be a three hour show that day. So hopefully enjoy it. But let's go on to the news of the day. One of the Department of Public Safety officer, he was fired today. He's the one that said that a wild looking man on a motorcycle, complete with tattoos and a purple mohawk, had shot at him. That's what all these police cars are about. Well, it turns out none of that happened, according to investigators. Around 6 o'clock Monday evening, that's when the officer called state police saying that a motorcyclist had shot at him on Juban Road. After interviews with witnesses, state police arrested Chandler Legrand for making up the story. He is now facing charges of malfeasance in office and filing false public records. And again, he has also been fired from his job with DP. Police say another biker attending the Lone Star Rally was killed after crashing on Highway 3 near Century Boulevard. This happened around midnight. There's no information yet on how that crash actually happened, but we're told that that was the motorcycle was involved. The driver died at the scene. Two other bikers were killed Friday night before attending that rally. Yeah, you know what? It's great getting payback and seeing cops actually going down for their bullshit. Especially the ones going around claiming, oh, you know, all we're one percenters are criminals. Yeah, they're just human like we are. So, and they actually do more bullshit than uh, one percenters do. Uh, our thoughts and prayers go out to those that uh, have family that went down in those motorcycle wrecks down in Texas. You guys be careful down there and uh, make sure you get home safe. But on our Legends segment, we're going to have Keith the Bandit Ball. And if you don't know who Keith is, I don't know what planet you're on, man. Uh, let me read a little thing from his Sturgis Hall of Fame inductee uh, thing on 2005. Biker, freedom fighter, author, publisher, editor, and promoter, builder, and patriot. Keith Ball has done it all. Done it well. And when presented with the new challenge, when it will astound everyone with the ease in which he tackles it. In 1971, he was hired to run the first national motorcycle rights organization, ABAY. Within a few years, ABAY grew into the largest grassroots motorcycle organization in the world, with 28 chapters and some 50,000 members. And it re still remains a viable force in biker rights today. You know, if you haven't seen the video that I did on ABAY, man, you want to check that shit out, man. ABAY, you guys rock. Uh, around the same time, Keith became an associate editor and the first ter uh, first time employee of a new motorcycle magazine called Easy Riders. He went on to become editor and ultimately the new director of 14 titles, including Familiar Titles in the Wind, Biker, and VQ. With Keith at the helm, Easy Riders became known as the Biker's Bible and boasted a monthly circulation of 550,000. Next, Keith pursued a longtime dream to write, completing three motorcycle adventure novels over the last eight years. He is also owns and operates a biker oriented website, bikernet.com, that offers tech material, classified riding tales, bench coverage, and legislative info. 
So, again, if you don't know who he is, you know, you don't know. You ain't in any of your motorcycle history, guys. Come on, man. Get on there. But let's uh, listen to Good Time Charlie's interview. And I got to say, man, you got to love how Charlie freaking interviews people, man. He just kicks back, chills. You know, that's the interviews I love. That's why I wa like watching them every morning on his Facebook when he goes live and on his morning show. So, again, get over there, check him out. But uh, let's hear him. Trying to preserve our history, so I figured I'd pick the top of the crop first and then work my way down. So you like uh, my number one guy here. That's just because I'm older than you are. <laughs> <laughs> hey, so tell the folks, uh, let's go all the way back when Keith Ball first got a mini bike. Tell me some stuff. Oh, God. Well, I'll tell you, I, my first vehicle was when I was 15 and a half. It was a Honda 55 Super Cup. I immediately modified it. And at the time, when you metal flaked something, or at least when goofballs metal flaked something, you took glitter and you dropped it all over the gas tank and you put resin over it. And so that's how I metal flaked my gas tank. Although, now, if you ran your hand over it, it would just tear the hell out of your skin. Because <laughs> no. So then, anyway, I had this little motorcycle, and it was my only vehicle. Now, I went to my dad, and I said, I'm buying a motorcycle, and he said, he said, I hate motorcycles. He said, um, he said I'll tell you what. He said, I, I, I knew of, I, my dad drove to work the same way every, way every day for 40 years. And he drove to Signal Hill and he worked in the oil fields. Well, one day a guy goes by him, a young guy goes by him on a new motorcycle. And he doesn't think much of it. But as the days go by, this guy goes by him and he goes by him faster and then the motorcycle's a little modified, and then the guy's growing a beard, and the guy looks more like a biker. And so one day this guy goes roaring by my dad's. He's probably cut his pipes off. He goes roaring by my dad, and he goes down. And my dad pulled over and, and ran up to the guy and said, are you okay? And <laughs> the guy said, yeah, I'm okay. And he says, it serves you right, you son of a bitch. <laughs> and he got back in his car and he went to work. But, you know, he made sure that the guy was okay. But so he told me, he said, you can have a motorcycle, but he said, I won't loan you money. You know, I'm not going to pay for your insurance. I'm not doing anything. It's on you, you know, because I don't like motorcycles. Well, I got a tweet here, and uh, 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 Jack, uh, I don't know where he's from, but he says, uh, 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 is it true that you you uh, started the abate uh, uh the thing uh, would abate. Well, actually, I met Lou Kimsey, and Lou Kimsey started abate, and him and Joe Teresi and Mill Blair, they actually started the Modified Motorcycle Institute or something, but then it evolved into abate over just a couple of months. Anyway, they started abate, and I was like 22 years old. And I had just got back from Vietnam, and I was going to college on the GI Bill, and I was building motorcycles and, and learning how to build in engines from Bob George. And, um, and this new motorcycle magazine came out, so I wrote to it, and I said, I helped this buddy of mine build a knucklehead. You might want to see it. Well, as it turns out, Easy Riders was being published in an apartment house in Seal Beach which was only like two miles from where this guy's bike was. So Luke Kimsey came over, and he looked at this guy's knucklehead that we built, and it was, it was a pretty nice bike. And so he said, okay, I'll feature it. He said, but I really like your bike. And at the time, I rode an 80-inch uh, shovel head that we had modified and put UL wheels in, and, uh, and it was a rat bike. It was a god-awful looking motorcycle. It was, it was all black and covered with grease. And he said, now don't, don't do anything to it. Leave it just like this. I want to feature it just like this. So um, I met him about a week later with uh, Brad, my buddy, and the knucklehead, and, the, um, and my shovelhead. And we met in some uh, oil fields, dusty oil fields, with Pete Chido, the, the little photographer who always did uh, feature bikes. Guy was a magnificent photographer, didn't know anything about being a biker. He just like would stand there and take pictures and keep his mouth shut. So uh, we did this, we did the feature shoot, and I was telling Lou a little about what I was doing, and I was working at a bike shop part-time. I didn't like the way they treated customers, and I, 
said something to him about it. And he said, well, why don't you come over to the office? The next week, I went over to the office and um, uh, Lou offered me a job, a part-time job, as the manager of a bait. Wow. I was like 22 years old. It was the third issue of Easy Riders that just come out. And he offers me this job, so I started. And that was Good Time Charlie. He was interviewing Keith Bandit Ball, our legend of the motorcycle scene. You can see the rest of the article on Good Time Charlie's uh, YouTube channel. Again, don't forget to go check him out in the mornings because he usually has a live going on at Facebook while he's uh, on the radio. And it's really good shit. Bikers Inner Circle over on Facebook and BIC Radio. Next, we're going to get to the Ask Hollywood, and today we don't have any haters. That's unreal. Un unreal, man. I usually get a lot of them, but I guess after the last video that we did, uh, I guess they don't want to come out and play. Anyway, and this is the big topic of the day. Love listening, but I get confused often by what seems like double speak. I'm aware of definitions, but are you saying one percenters are so-called because they live outside society norms, outside the law, break the law, or what? What is your definition? Uh, one percenters, uh, if you, it, basically it comes down to this, guys. Everybody knows the damn story of the AMA and shit. AMA was a sanctioned type of deal. And anybody who had events outside of their sanction were called outlaws. Next thing you know, the Hollister shit goes on. And next thing you, they're saying, well, 99% of uh, the biking community is all great, blah, 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 blah. Anyway, that's where the 1% come. And then you got the big 1% clubs that started off. Hells Angels, Pagans, Outlaws, Mongols, Banditos, Sons of Silence. El Forestals, everybody starting up uh, the 1% stuff back then. And it's usually funny because I do get a lot of these questions. And I haven't really addressed it, I guess. But a new thing on the internet is people going around saying, well, I got a 1%er attitude and, or I'm an, I live the outlaw life, but I don't need to be a part of no club. Well, okay, here's the deal. Go tell that to a one percenter. You know, go up to one percenter, tell them that you're a one percenter. Uh, you just don't need to be a part of the club. Most people don't understand that these uh, guys go through a hang around, a prospect period, and they put their bones in. Man, let me tell you, they put a hard work in to get in that patch. So that one percent diamond means a lot to them. For guys to go out there and then bash them and say, well, you know, fuck one percenters this, fuck one percenters that. And next thing you know, they're going around saying, well, I got the one percenter attitude or I'm an outlaw. And one thing I don't understand about the outlaw gig is, I guess it's your definition of what an outlaw is. But uh, last time I checked, an outlaw don't run to a damn cop, don't support cops. Uh, because they're an outlaw. It's just common sense to me. Uh, but yeah, you do have a lot of them people going around saying, yeah, I live this kind of life and live that kind of life. Well, it's easy to say on the internet, but when it comes to the streets, it's a whole different subject. Let me tell you, they don't speak that much like that on the on the streets, <laughs> you know, if you want to be a one percenter, then, you know, go put the work in, earn that uh, diamond. That's what I can tell you. If you uh, go around there and say uh, you're a one percenter, but don't need to be uh, involved in the club, I just think you're a punk and, uh, you know, you're too scared to go put in the work, I guess. Uh, that's just the way I feel because uh, it does get kind of freaking uh, funny. You know, because a lot of them same guys that say they have one percent or at attitudes or they're outlaws, they're the first first one to back cops up. They're the first one to freaking uh, bang on freaking uh, you know these uh, one percent or big five clubs. They're the first ones to do it, but they're an outlaw, right? Come on, man, really? You know, it, it's not a game. You know, the internet is one thing. Yeah, you can do, say whatever the fuck you want to say on the internet. Uh, but <laughs> in real life, we all know it's different. You know, you got the jokers out there saying that shit. It, it's just funny. 
It makes me laugh. You know, if your definition of an outlaw is you go do what you want, live the way you want to live, well, actually, you're talking about a biker. You know, you're a biker. You know, you're not an outlaw, one percenter. You know, again, outlaws don't run and support cops or call cops if you're a true outlaw. So I guess it's just your definition, and uh, hopefully, and well, I I have to get to that question. I forgot that. Get to that question. Uh, it don't mean you have to be out there doing criminal shit and stuff like that. It's, you know, you put your bones in, man. You put in your time to be a one percenter. Uh, but, uh, yeah, that don't mean go out there and cause all kinds of shit. It does mean you stand your ground and you demand respect. You know, that's just the way the streets work. And I think that's what a lot of problem with people are is they don't understand how the streets work. Because a lot of the guys now are, you know, mid-40s, early 50s, mid-50s, whatever, going through those mid-life prices and think they can pick up a bike and go holler and hooting around and doing whatever the fuck they want, thinking they know what the freaking uh, club scene's about. And it's really funny when you actually see them out there on the streets and shit like that and how fast they'll cower and all that good crap, but, uh, anyway, that was that, I want a big announcement, the new age of biking and brotherhood will be going out on audio, I'm thinking Wednesday it will be available, and what I'm going to do with the audio, uh, part of it is also throw in five hours of interviews with the clubs I've had, confederation of clubs, and I'm going to throw you the free ebook, uh, The Legitimate Motorcycle Club. Also, we have the Iron Order Motorcycle Club. And this is an in depth review of the Iron Order Motorcycle Club. Uh, it's critical that I could say uh, of what they are, what they do, and how the motorcycle club has changed since they've came on the scene. So, with that, hopefully, you enjoy the show. By the end of the week, we'll have a great new studio up, and we're actually going to get, uh, instead of this uh, camera, we're going to have a wide span uh, one on a pods, and have all kinds of bells and whistles I need to learn, because I still haven't learned this damn mixer board. I hate digital shit. I should have just stuck with my analog stuff. But with that, I'll talk to you guys later.